Today on Path of Grace. A lot of time had come and gone. There is a big gap between when the prophecy was given and when we would see these prophecies beginning to be fulfilled. And I'm sure with all those years passing, people who would have heard about the prophecy and about that dream, they wrote it off as fantasy. But you know what? Given enough time, it was all going to come down. And I believe it's the same way today. You know, a lot of people say things like, you wacko Bible-believing people, you really believe in some sort of snatching away? You really believe that one day Jesus, who lived a couple thousand years ago, you believe he's going to return? Come on. If that was going to happen, it would have happened already. Why are you still focused on that stuff? That is fantasy. Let me tell you, my friend, you give it enough time. I believe that God is going to do what God said he is going to do. And one thing for sure is that today we are a day closer than we were yesterday. I loved my second grade teacher. She was an incredibly great lady, a wonderful lady. But sometimes, got to be honest, she really, really confused me. She didn't confuse me with math or reading or whatever else we were learning in second grade. She confused me because she loved to use all sorts of figures of speech that made no sense to me when I was seven years old, at least not at first. But eventually, over time, I began to understand what she was talking about a little bit better. Think about it. When you tell a second grader that they are out in left field, they have too many irons in the fire, they need to get down to the brass tacks so they can escape by the skin of their teeth because someone heard through the grapevine that the handwriting is on the wall. That little kid doesn't know what the heck you're talking about. Exactly how are you supposed to put on a thinking cap? How do you hear something through a grapevine and has anyone ever really seen the handwriting on the wall? Well, the answer to that last question is yes. Someone has seen the handwriting on the wall, and today as we continue our study through the book of Daniel, we see where that phrase originated from. It's in Daniel chapter 5. Go ahead and turn there if you have a Bible handy. Now, as we come to this chapter, a lot of time has passed since we were first introduced to Daniel and his friends back in chapter 1. They were captured and taken to Babylon when they were teenagers which was about 70 years earlier. And so by this time, Daniel is at least in his 80s, maybe even as old as 90. We don't know for sure. The Babylonian Empire was still very much ruling the world, although things were getting shaky and something was about to happen. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar, who we've been studying about, had died between chapters 4 and 5, and several other Babylonians had tried to establish themselves on the throne. But at this point, we find a man named Belshazzar ruling over Babylon. And the prophecy about Babylon being overthrown, the prophecy that came through a dream God had given King Nebuchadnezzar years earlier, the dream, remember, that Daniel had interpreted, it's about to come to pass. And we'll see it come to pass in this chapter. Now again, think about it. A lot of time had come and gone. There is a big gap between when the prophecy was given and when we would see these prophecies beginning to be fulfilled. And I'm sure with all those years passing, people who would have heard about the prophecy and about that dream, they wrote it off as fantasy. But you know what? Given enough time, it was all going to come down. And I believe it's the same way today. You know, a lot of people say things like, you wacko Bible-believing people, you really believe in some sort of snatching away you really believe that one day jesus who lived a couple thousand years ago you believe he's going to return come on if that was going to happen it would have happened already why are you still focused on that stuff that is fantasy let me tell you my friend give it enough time and i believe that god is going to do what god said he is going to do and one thing for sure is that today we are a day closer than we were yesterday. Let's go ahead and jump into Daniel chapter 5. I will be reading from Young's literal translation, so it's worded a little bit differently. A lot of years have passed again, and we come to verse 1, and it says, Belshazzar, the king hath made a great feast to a thousand of his great men, and before the thousand he is drinking wine. In other words, he's trying to impress a thousand great people. He's drinking wine, having a party with them. Verse 2, 
Belshazzar hath said, while tasting the wine, to bring in the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar his father, now when it says Nebuchadnezzar was his father, um, it's just speaking of him being a king that had come before him. We don't know if they were truly blood relatives, but oftentimes a king would refer to a previous king as his father. So while he's tasting the wine, he gives the order to bring in the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar his father had taken from the temple that is in Jerusalem. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar had plundered Jerusalem and taken these implements of worship from the temple. And so Belshazzar, the king, says, let's go get those things and bring them in so we can drink out of them. Look at verse 2 again. Belshazzar hath said, while tasting the wine, to bring in the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar his father had taken from the temple, that is in Jerusalem, that drink with them may the king and his great men, his wives and his concubines. So here's this guy. He's in his prime. He's at his peak. He's wanting to show off for all of his buddies how big and powerful he is. He remembers back to King Nebuchadnezzar taking these implements of worship from the temple of God. And he says, you know what? Let's get those things and we'll drink from them right here in my palace. Verse 3, then they have brought in the vessels of gold that have been taken out of the temple of the house of God that is in Jerusalem and drunk with them have the king and his great men, his wives and his concubines. They have drunk wine and, check this out in verse 4, have praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. So he takes these implements of worship that had been in the temple in Jerusalem, the temple of the one true living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who the words of prophecy had come from earlier on about this kingdom eventually crashing. And it's as if he's saying, let's mock all of that. Let's get those gold and silver vessels that we took from that temple in Jerusalem. Let's take those so-called holy artifacts and let's drink a toast to what's really important. Our gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. I guess you could say here he was expressing a disdain for God and all that he had heard about God's message for them. He had to have heard about the dream Nebuchadnezzar had had years earlier. He had to have heard about the interpretation. Again, he probably saw the fulfillment of it as pure fantasy. You know, too much time has passed. That's not going to happen. And we are the superpower of the world. Nothing can happen to us. Kind of like today, it's hard for us to imagine a nation falling, especially a major world superpower. But can it happen? You betcha. Is any kingdom of man going to last forever? I don't think so. Look at history. How many have really lasted? They come and they go. And here's this king. He's happy. He's content. Not imagining in the least bit that those prophecies are going to come to pass. He couldn't see how Babylon could ever fall. Babylon would forever rule the world. We're safe. Verse 5. In that hour come forth, have fingers of a man's hand, and they are riding over against the candlestick on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king is seeing the extremity of the hand that is riding. So here we find the handwriting on the wall. They're having this big party in the middle of Belshazzar's celebration of himself and this kingdom of man as they're drinking a toast to their gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone, suddenly this floating hand appears and begins to write on this stone wall. And can you imagine how much of a freak out moment that would have been? Verse 6, look what it says. Then the king's countenance hath changed, and his thoughts do trouble him. And the joints of his loins are loosed, and his knees are smiting one against another. Call doth the king mightily. In other words, he screams to bring up the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. Answering hath the king, and said to the wise men of Babylon, that any man who doth read this writing and give its interpretation, they're going to be clothed in purple. They're going to get a bracelet of gold. They're going to get all of this wonderful stuff, and they're going to be third in the kingdom ruling there in Babylon with the king. So, Following in the footsteps of previous kings, he calls for all the wise guys of the world, his religious leaders, these great philosophers and thinkers, the astrologers, the soothsayers, the Chaldeans. He's hoping 
they can help. Verse 8, then coming up are all the wise men of the king, but they're not able to read the writing or give an interpretation to the king. Verse 9, then the king, Belshazzar, became greatly troubled. His countenance is changing and his great men are all perplexed. Then in verse 10, the queen, on account of the words of the king and his great men to the banquet house, hath come up. Answered hath the queen and said, O king, to the ages live, let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor thy countenance be changed. There is a man in thy kingdom, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, and in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, as the wisdom of the gods was found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, chief of the scribes, enchanters, Chaldeans, soothsayers, established him, thy father, O king. So she's reminding him about Daniel, the old man of God, the prophet who represents and speaks on behalf of the God whom this king had just been mocking by drinking from those gold instruments of worship from the temple. Verse 12, because that an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams and showing of enigmas and loosing of knots was found in him. In Daniel, whose name the king made Belteshazzar, now let Daniel be called, and the interpretation he doth show. So call Daniel. He'll be able to tell you. Verse 13. Then Daniel hath been caused to come up before the king. Answered hath the king and said to Daniel, Thou art that Daniel, that one? who art of the sons of the removed of Judah, whom the king my father brought in out of Judah? Verse 14, And I have heard of thee, that the spirit of the gods is in thee, and light and understanding and excellent wisdom have been found in thee. And now, cause to come up before me have been the wise men, the enchanters, that this writing they may read and its interpretation to cause me to know that they are not able to show the interpretation to the king. And I, I have heard of thee that thou art able to give interpretations and to loose knots. Now, lo, thou art able to read the writing and its interpretation to cause me to know. Purple thou dost put on, and a bracelet of gold is on thy neck, and third in the kingdom thou dost rule. He's saying, listen, if you can interpret this for me, you're going to be third in the kingdom. You're going to get gold. You're going to be rich. Verse 17, then hath Daniel answered and said before the king, thy gifts be to thyself and thy fee to another give. Nevertheless, the writing I do read to the king and the interpretation I cause him to know. Daniel says, king, keep your stuff. I don't need anything from you. Don't want anything from you. I don't care about being third in your kingdom, but I will let you know what the handwriting says and what God is saying to you. Verse 18, thou, O king, God most high, a kingdom and greatness and glory and honor he gave to Nebuchadnezzar thy father. And because of the greatness that he gave to him, in other words, Daniel saying, this kingdom that you're now ruling over, it was all established. It came into existence because of what God did. You people may not worship this God at all, but your kingdom exists because it was part of God's plan. He gave it to King Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 19 again, because of the greatness that he gave to him, all peoples, nations, and languages were trembling and fearing before him. Whom he willed, he was slaying, and whom he willed, he was keeping alive, and whom he willed, he was raising up, and whom he willed, he was making low. And when his heart was high, in other words, when Nebuchadnezzar became all prideful and filled with himself, and his spirit was strong to act proudly, he hath been caused to come down from the throne of his kingdom, and his glory they have caused to pass away from him. And from the sons of men he was driven. And his heart with the beasts hath been like, and with the wild asses was his dwelling. The herb like oxen he ate, and by the dew of the heavens his body was wet, till that he came to know that God most high is ruler in the kingdom of men, and whom he willeth he raiseth up over it. He's saying, King, let me remind you of a story I know you've heard. And let me remind you that it was very real. Let me remind you of what happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. He had all sorts of power, just like you. He was wrapped up in himself, just like you. He was full of pride, just like you. He wanted to believe that God wasn't going to do what God said he was going to do, just like you. He thought his reign would never end, just like you. He thought there was no way that it was really God who raised up kings and brought them down. But let me remind you, that very, very quickly, God took him from the palace to a pasture and from eating royal banquets to eating grass like a cow. 
not just to make a point to the world, but to get his attention, that he would have a change of mind for the better. And you remember from our last study, that eventually happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. And we saw that he wrote a letter to the world talking about those events happening and basically said it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Losing everything, being humbled was the best thing ever because it brought me to the place of finally knowing that God is God. Verse 22, And thou, his son, Belshazzar, hast not humbled thy heart, though all this thou hast known. He's saying, you know what? You knew what happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Yet you're following in his footsteps, and maybe you're even worse. You haven't humbled your heart at all. Verse 23, And against the Lord of the heavens thou hast lifted up thyself, and the vessels of his house they have brought in before thee, and thou and thy great men, thy wives and thy concubines are drinking wine from them, and gods of silver and of gold, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone, that are not seeing, nor hearing, nor knowing, thou hast praised. Saying, what are you doing? You're worshiping these gods that don't know anything. They don't see, they don't hear, because they don't exist. You're worshiping those things, exalting those things, and mocking, and coming against the Lord who created everything. And then the rest of verse 23. And the God in whose hand is thy breath, and all thy ways, him thou hast not honored. Now we come to the handwriting on the wall, verse 24. Then from before him sent is the extremity of the hand, and the writing is noted down. He's saying, if you've wondered where that hand came from, it's from God. Verse 25. And this is the writing that is noted down. In other words, here's what the writing says. Numbered, numbered, weighed, and divided. That's all that was written on the wall. Numbered, numbered, weighed, and divided. Verse 26, this is the interpretation of the thing. Numbered. God hath numbered thy kingdom and hath finished it. Verse 27, weighed. Thou art weighed in the balances and hast been found lacking. Verse 28, divided. Divided is thy kingdom and it hath been given to the Medes and the Persians. So Daniel says, here's the interpretation, man. These words on the wall, they are from the God who you've been mocking, the God who had given a prophecy in the days of Nebuchadnezzar. Those things that you thought would never come to pass, they're happening, and they're happening now. This kingdom of man is going down. This empire that you see is immovable. It's about to be moved. Verse 29, Then hath Belshazzar said, and they have clothed Daniel with purple, and a bracelet of gold is on his neck, and they proclaimed concerning him that he is the third ruler in the kingdom. Daniel had already told him he didn't want anything from the king. But the king goes ahead and gives him all this stuff, makes him third ruler in the kingdom. Daniel didn't care about those things. But it's almost as if Belshazzar is hoping that by giving him this stuff, it'll change the course of things, that the words of this prophecy won't really come to pass. But then look at verse 30. In that night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. Verse 31, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom when a son of 60 and two years. Wow, that very night. It was all over for the ruler of Babylon. They were having this great big party. Everything seemed wonderful, except for that handwriting on the wall. And along comes Daniel. Oh, he's just one of those crazy prophecy-believing guys. Come on, Babylon is safe and secure. No one can conquer this kingdom. This kingdom will never fall. Hmm. When that handwriting hit the wall, what no one knew, what the king was unaware of, what none of these Babylonians could imagine, was that the Medes and Persians had already found a way into Babylon. At that time, the city had a huge wall around it that was supposed to be wide enough chariots could race on it. The city had a huge amount of food stored up. They even had crops growing within the walls. They'd even come up with an ingenious way of making sure they had a steady supply of fresh water. They had diverted a portion of the Euphrates River to run through the middle of the city. Now, the way this worked was they had made a place in the wall where the water would pass through way down beneath the surface. So this kingdom seemed impenetrable. It seemed unconquerable. The city itself was the ultimate in safety and security. From the perspective of man, there was nothing that could ever 
topple it. These words of prophecy were fantasy that would never be fulfilled. You know what the Medes did? It was so simple. They blocked off the water that was flowing in underneath the wall. And as the water level dropped, it made an opening under the wall where the Mede army was able to just walk right in under the wall on the riverbed. And so they walked right in while people were sleeping, took the city and killed the king. And just like that, through something so simple that the Babylonians didn't even imagine it could happen, that kingdom literally overnight was gone. It crashed as another rose up. Just like that, suddenly, unexpectedly, I guess you could say, like a thief in the night, everything changed. Everything changed so quickly. My friend, very quickly, things can change. And one day, and it may be soon, big changes are going to take place on this planet. A kingdom is coming. Eventually, this age we're living in, this present evil age, will come to an end. The handwriting is on the wall and on the pages of a very special book. My name is James Flanders. Thank you so much for listening. Be blessed, my friend. Be blessed.